Hello, good evening to all and uh, welcome to all our dignitaries, our special guests, principals of various schools who have given up their time for the All India Educators Forum to discuss on the curriculum and extracurricular changes of 2021. I am really filled with gratitude uh, that uh, they have agreed to accept this. The principals are very busy at this point of time with so many things, but in spite of that, you have accepted uh, you, uh, to hold this session for our educators. So once again, I want to welcome all our viewers who are anticipating a lot of information from this session on what 2021 is going to be about. 2020 was so, uh, uh, un we were so unprepared with what happened and we had to suddenly go from the four walls of a classroom to online. Teaching became any time and anywhere. And CBSE has brought about so many changes, drastic changes in the coming years, uh, especially with the implementing of the new national education policy, which is going to come up. So I think some major real challenges are there for every school. So here we are in the next 90 minutes to discuss with you and to share with you what our principles feel will be the major changes for this year. So on that note, I will first uh, introduce to you our panel members for the day. We have Prem Kumar sir joining us from Kuwait. Uh, he is uh, a, a recipient of the Outstanding Educators Award from CBSE and he's a CBSE resource person and a great, great mentor for the All India Educators Forum. Prem Kumar sir, welcome. And we have Mridula Mahajan ma'am with us, uh, who is the principal of uh, Dr. D.Y. Patil in uh, Pune and he's also been a Great, great support for the AAF in the past years. And she's a sports person and uh, she's been uh, in the Indian national level player. She is of softball and cricket. So it's a real privilege, ma'am, to have you here. She's in the curriculum committee. So <laughs> I'm very happy that someone who's from the sports background is with us to highlight on those issues. Then uh, Yogita Kapil, ma'am, will be joining us shortly. She is from DPS Hyderabad. Then we have Pooja Bose, ma'am, who is the principal of the High Range School in Munar, Kerala, and uh, she was formerly the principal of Care Mangalam in Noida and DPS Noida. And she has all she's also conducting a lot of programs for CBSC. We have Archana Rodriguez, ma'am, who is from St. Joseph's, Mumbai, and also very active uh, role she plays in our uh, uh, AIF sessions. She has conducted so many sessions, and she is actually a, a special educator by heart, and she does a lot of special uh, sessions on uh, differentiated learning. And today I am sure that she's going to share what will happen with the new NEP that's coming up. And we also have uh, Minakshi Narula ma'am who will be joining us shortly, who is the principal of Shemford uh, Futuristic K-12 School in UP. So first of all, let me begin my session today uh, by uh, inviting Prem Kumar sir, uh, who as I told is the principal of uh, the uh, Bhavan Square and he was also the chairperson of the Gulf schools. He's got a wide range of experience. Uh, so I will uh, invite him to uh, tell us briefly about what he feels is going to be the major change for the year and what will be the uh, methodology. Is there going to be a change? Is it going to be the same lecture method or you would like to uh, have, you know, like the CBC is now telling to introduce stories telling as a, you know, format of introducing lessons. So, sir, would you like to talk to our audience today about how to impart education through storytelling as a methodology, as a pedagogy? Good evening, Matthew, sir. Uh, good evening, uh, principals uh, who are going to be speakers of the day today. Good evening to all the audience who are live on YouTube now. Thank you for inviting me, Matthew, sir to speak on the changes that NEP is envisaging uh, in the years to come. Of course, we have been talking a lot from the beginning about the student-centric approach to teaching. It hasn't been happening so far. But now with the NEP 2020 going to be in place, I think all the teaching fraternity will have to change their methodology and come into this line of thinking of imparting a student-centric education in the schools. 
And with so many changes happening in the near future, the structure itself is changing from 10 plus 2 to 5 plus 3 plus 3 plus 4. There's a lot of emphasis in the pre-primary and primary education. And for all the primary educators who are with us today on live, I should say one of the methodologies that will come into play in a very big way is the storytelling as a pedagogy. Now, I would like to describe storytelling as a context enriched by emotions. Traditionally, it is through story that all of us today, we have grown up in our families when it was a joint family with our grandparents. So it is through story that important, meaningful information has been passed down through many, many generations from time immemorial, not just now. But in between storytelling faded, but now with the NEP 2020 going to be implemented soon in schools, this will be a very important methodology that teachers will have to use, especially the pre-primary and the primary teachers. Factual information is so readily available to all of us in a technology ruled world, that is through the electronic media. But that lacks an emotional impact, if you ask me. Emotion is a critical element that makes information relevant and very memorable, I believe, as a teacher. Even for a teacher who is teaching the senior most class, that is grade 12, I have some fantastic stories in chemistry, the subject which I teach. And I can see the glow in the eyes of the students whenever I teach them through storytelling. For me, storytelling, it's an art that demands interpretation and it relies both creative and critical thought process. Because as human beings, we author our lives by assembling artifacts of our past and creating narratives that reveal our world and our true selves. That is, we live our stories. Our stories reflect our years, the difficult storms and the peaceful joys. Therefore, sh sharing our own stories adds more depth to life. And it gives more meaningful to our relationship with the students whom we teach. And it provides more context in our work as well. So listening to each other's stories help us to show empathy in the class, in the society. Better connection with one another. And better understanding of complex thoughts. The story of uh, Edison the story of uh, Benjamin Franklin, story of um, Kekule, so many stories. So storytelling for me, it's a universal, you know, uh, part and parcel and multicultural. It involves a give and take. Stories can reveal personal power as well as personal identity. So for me, remembering a story is more powerful than recalling facts. So storytelling as a pedagogy is something which I would like every teacher to accept and adopt in their classes. Because storytelling is a powerful tool. Simply put, storytelling is delivering information in a very organic form. The teacher is the storyteller and the teacher is a performer. Share a similar perform to inform, engage and entertain their students. It's an entertainment for the students. The voice modulation, the body language, the movements, they're all something which students would love rather than 
mere lecturing, as Matthew Sir was talking about. So they all seek to communicate their message in the most compelling and provocative way possible. I remember an author, Gail Goodwin, who says, and I quote him now, good teaching is one-fourth preparation and three-fourths theater. Storytelling engages the audience. The audience in this case is your students, right? In a very unique way. So it is a device in the repertoire of a good teacher. It's not only a potent tool for the teacher, but the dynamic means for students to express what they have learned. So the magic of storytelling changes the atmosphere in the classroom, especially when you are dealing with the young minds. They love listening to stories. And stories serve to open the mind so that the hearer is ready to take things in. In short, I can say for sure, stories appeal to the heart of young and old, right? So teachers believe that it's storytelling is only for the kindergarten or grade one and two kids. Not at all. I have tried storytelling in class 11 and 12. And I can tell you for sure, they enjoyed those lessons much more than when I delivered facts. Because I believe once heart is one, the mind is open to learn. That's what I believe. So what are the objectives that CBSC has in mind when they talk about using storytelling as a pedagogy? Stories promote lively imagination on the part of the, stu the students. Because when students listen to story, they create mind pictures. Each one creates a different mind picture where there is creativity and originality, you see. All cannot create the same mind picture. They make inferences and predictions and they can fill in the gaps as well. They, in a sense, become involved with the teacher in creating the story thus forming a very strong relationship with the narrative. So when packaged as a story, your lesson, the oral delivery of information promotes greater involvement than does in a very written language. So through storytelling, the teacher can achieve the following. That is improving the verbal skill, gaining confidence, self-confidence, then discovering the meaning of the events, developing a love for language, encourages the higher levels of cognitive thinking, gaining a more in-depth understanding of the narration. It improves the imaginative skills, it can also improve the writing skill and it involves active participation of the learner. So storytelling is such an effective tool for the teacher because it is a powerful form of communication. If a teacher cannot communicate well, if the teacher does not have the control over the language, then storytelling will not be effective at all. So the teacher has to himself or herself work on improving the communication skill. Both the student and the teacher will benefit from it. Right? Students learn from hearing stories because they pay closer attention in the class. They don't get distracted easily because they watch the body movement and the language of the teacher and stay glued to the lesson that is being taught in the class. They understand the message from the teacher more readily. They're willing to accept it rather than a drab lesson. And they also retain the key points and they can connect the concept learned very easily at a later date. Right? 
Today also, if you ask the students of class 12 or 11, the structure of benzene, first what comes to their mind is the story that I delivered in the class about Kekule's dreaming while he was traveling in the bus in London. So they connect quickly to the, the, the scene or the episode that was shared while teaching this concept. And teachers become better educators because being able to tell a story effectively enhances the perception of the teacher as a leader in the class. A teacher who can adeptly tell a story reveals a very approachable, likable and human side to his or her own personality and the students would love to attend the class of such a teacher. So this helps to close the distance between the teacher and the students by making the teacher's status less threatening in the class. Otherwise, the teacher has to, you know, most of the time say, pay attention, pay attention, listen to me. But when you start narrating a story, I don't think even once a teacher will say, pay attention to me, because students love to listen and they'll be anticipating what next, what happened next. When the apple from the, fell from the tree, when Newton was sitting under the tree, what happens if Newton just took the apple and ate? Now, this question, if you ask a student, you can imagine how the thinking would shift. Because Newton asked the question, why did this apple fall? It led to the gravitational force and all that happened later. So asking a question triggers many thoughts in the mind. Now, what are the classroom application of storytelling as a pedagogy? So when preparing your lesson notes for a class, a teacher should decide how best to present the material. So the teacher should consider packaging the information in the form of a story than a simple lecture standing in one place and delivering the concepts. So when deciding how to help the students to process information or to assess the students how they have learned, consider having the students recreate the information. So that's the talent of the teacher. Now, here are some of the ways that I believe that storytelling can be applied in a classroom setting. Any classroom setting I'm talking about, any subject, even mathematics, you can create wonderful stories and impress your students. So create a story to illustrate new concepts or ideas. You have to spend time for that. Or express a topic or theme by narrating a story about it. You have technology today to support you to find different stories. You can explain the historical events by narrating them as stories. Now, if you want to teach radioactivity and its effects, think of the death of Napoleon Bonaparte. Very few people know about the arsenic poisoning of Napoleon. Create a story about that. They will understand better about the poisoning effect of arsenic and radioactivity. Invent and tell a story of historical figures meeting one another or about characters from different stories meeting. Put all the knowledge that needs to be assessed in a very narrative form and tell the story to teacher and the class. Take a very familiar story and recall it with characters and situations based on your curricular materials for the language teachers. So as a pedag pedagogical tool, Teachers should use storytelling to explore cultural diversity, 
to survey storytelling methods, to discover varieties of ways to create stories, because creating stories is not an easy task. You have to spend sufficient time in this so that it is very well integrated into your curriculum, so that you can foster imagination and to investigate the power of narrative. So to end my thoughts on the storytelling as a pedagogy, I would say stories go beyond mere presentation of facts. Anyone can present a fact. Even students can nowadays present beautiful lessons in the class with the PPT because they get enough information from the Google, Google teacher, right? But they cannot deliver it in a manner that everyone would pay attention and listen very carefully. So presenting facts is no big deal. But how do you present the facts? How, how your presentations impacted the mind and the soul of the student, that really matters. So if you present a lesson using story, telling as a pedagogy, they will engage the students and their students' imagination will be definitely enhanced and you as a teacher will feel satisfied. So these are my thoughts in making some changes in your uh, 2021, um, you know, the year 21, 22 and beyond that. Thank you and so I much, Prem Kumar sir. <laughs> really wonderful session. And I do agree with Prem Kumar sir because the story, irrespective of age, it's not that it's only for primary or middle school or senior. Um, even at the age of 40, 50 or 60, we would like, love to hear stories because that's what yeah. movies are all about, right? So yeah. I remember uh, when I used to go to my classes and I used to start coordinate geometry. And, you know, there is a story about Rene Descartes lying on his bed and seeing the cobwebs. Yes. And yes. then he gets inspired, you know, to make those X axis and Y axis and they get very excited. So that's uh, absolutely correct, sir, that uh, whenever we present something irrespective of the class, age, whatever, when we are uh, putting our classes, if we are having a story behind it, it, it becomes all the more interesting. And I'm sure our uh, teachers who are listening to us today will uh, take this idea of taking the storytelling sessions, not only for primary kids, but also to the senior classes oh, and implement yeah. this. Thank you so much, Prem Kumar, sir, for joining us. And uh, thank you for the wonderful session. Our next speaker is uh, Murudila Mahajan, ma'am, uh, who is the principal of Dr. D.Y. Patil School in Pune, Maharashtra. And as I had told in the beginning, she is a sports person and uh, she's a national level. She was a national level player of softball and cricket. I don't know how many times, 10 times, 15 times, I don't know. So being a national level player is something great. And she is part of, I think, the Halo India, which was uh, brought about. And she's a national trainer with Halo India. And uh, today, uh, 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 we are privileged to have Radhila Ma'am with us, uh, who is going to talk to us about uh, puppets and uh, how to integrate the, you know, there was a toy fair recently and the CBC had brought out a lot of notices in this and she's going to talk something about how to introduce toys, puppets and also sports, the uh, integration of sports as the NEP says is very integral part. So over to you, Radhila ma'am. We are very eager to listen to you. Once again, very good evening, uh, Matthew, sir. Am I audible? Yes, ma'am. Yes, ma'am. Perfect. Yes. So, very good evening to all the principals, the respected speakers, and the audience. I am here to speak about the toy pedagogy. And, uh, of course, sports integrated learning. So, let's first begin with the toy pedagogy, something very appealing and something very different. Of course, toy pedagogy was mentioned in the previous years, but not perhaps implemented with that effect and effort is what I feel. So let's try and find out what is the change as per NEP. NEP, my friends, has stressed a lot on the early years. That is the foundational stage of the children's development. 
and it is rightly written over there in the NEP draft that 85% of the cumulative brain development happens by age six. Now, what I wish to say is that children find play to something very interesting. It comes very naturally. And that means toys come very naturally to them. NEP says child-centered education as opposed to exam-centered approach. And that is what will happen when we include toy pedagogy in the teaching learning process. Change is the essence, change is the necessity. And so change must happen in the field of education also. We must try new methods, unique techniques. And so toy pedagogy is just one of them. It is during my friends that wish to have a world of their own. They like to create, construct, and control. Children love it when the learning is joyful. And what could be a better way than to make them stress-free by using toy pedagogy? And what is pedagogy? Pedagogy, of course, is a method of teaching and a practice. Practice, teaching, learning. Now, let us not forget that our Prime Minister in Man Ki Baat, in August 2020, very clearly mentioned toy pedagogy. He mentioned the importance of toys. He mentioned the importance of creating and manufacturing toys as a part of Atmanirbhar Bharat. And he also spoke about vocal for local. And it could easily be connected to NEP. That is exactly what I'm going to talk about. We must think about the rootedness that we have towards this country. And so I will quote the example of one of the most popular educationists of India, Ratna Tagore, who said that toy pedagogy is very important, who advocated and propagated the thought of toy pedagogy. And toys and games have traveled a long way to come to their present form. They have existed since ancient times, since the Indus Valley civilization. But why is pedagogy? We are complaining today about the attention span of children, about the concentration. But what if toys could be used in the class? What if toy room could be developed and teaching could happen in this room? Definitely, we are going to put our children in the habit of sitting continuously for long hours and get tasks completed. Moreover, they will engage in fruitful and constructive activities. Yes. Toy makers design toys to see that how children react, how children learn, and how they will apply that learning to their real life. This happens in India and many countries of the world. So toy manufacturing also is a big market. And Modiji has told us 7 lakh crores is the work of this market. What is one more advantage? What if we can train our students to not just learn from toys, but also learn to create toys, to manufacture toys, to devise new games. Because toy pedagogy includes gaming and gamification. It is not only about the smaller toys that we are talking. It is about games also. It is about coding. It is about AI. And toys help children to connect to our culture. The use of traditional Indian games and toys will help our children. Mirdula, ma'am. Uh, just check your mic, ma'am. Mirdula, ma'am.
Madhula ma'am, can you hear me? Radhila ma'am, ma'am, Radhila ma'am, ma'am we can't hear you. Ma'am you are on mute, just uh, unmute yourself. Okay, we'll get Mridhala ma'am back. Don't worry. Uh, there is, seems to be some issue on our end. No problem. Uh, if Mridhala ma'am is uh, able to hear us, uh, she can respond and she can join. Otherwise, ma'am. Uh, Mridhala ma'am. Uh, Ma'am, we'll come back to you. Ma'am, we'll come back to you. Uh, there seems to be some audio issues. Uh, we can sort it out later. Yeah, so uh, we just continue with the program. Yeah, so I think Mirdala Ma'am will join in. I think there is some audio issue on our end. Uh, I will invite uh, Yogita, ma'am. She is already uh, ready with us. And as I informed earlier, she is the principal of uh, DPS Sahibaba and a security resource person. Uh, she is working closely with CBC with the project based learning method. So, ma'am, I will invite you. To speak something on that. Good evening, sir. Thank you for this opportunity. And a very good evening to all the co panelists, honored co panelists, and uh, the audience, respected audience. Thanks for joining in. So, I think, uh, sir, there is still some disturbance. Uh, so, I'll continue. Right, so this sounds good. Uh, so uh, very good evening to all the people who've joined in, dear principals, dear teachers. A new pedagogy that is in place is PBL, that is project-based learning. So it was happening in uh, many nations across the world that children were learning in a different manner. Their learning was self-driven. They owned the learning and the teacher guided them to cover the gaps. She would sit, analyze and help the children to cover the gap. This was project based learning. So we've heard of uh, projects coming in. Uh, children, uh, they make projects, they submit projects and then they uh, get some grades, some assessment is done. So this was happening in India that uh, we were giving work to the children. We were expecting some pro uh, 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 product, tangible uh, project to come back to us. And then this project, we would turn the pages, look into the project. If the project was excellent, all illustrations, all write-ups, analysis, everything is put, we would give marks to the child. 
and if the art was integrated though the term art integration was not there but yes art if the art was integrated uh, we would give a grade or full marks right so uh, the project based learning is little different project based learning is uh, we are not looking forward to an end product so not something that would come in the end and we expect that to be graded for so this is a process it's a pedagogy in which the learner is actively involved it's research based so what learner is expected to do is any uh, project that comes his way is divided into uh, milestones so there are my learning milestones put in the projects and as i told very clearly that the teachers as a teacher i would not look forward to a final product that should come up very well it's the process it's the pedagogy that we see if the child is learning accepting absorbing and then executing or not so it's a collaborative effort most of the pbls are collaborative in nature they can be multidisciplinary uh, so wherein uh, the disciplines are involved many disciplines are involved and uh, it can be stand alone also wherein there's just one subject but many aspects of that subject are taken care of so it's it's a way in which teacher is uh, she creates a very intelligent question that probes research so child is expected to do research it can be a group work it can be an individual work usually pbls uh, what i'll suggest is to do in a collaborative manner wherein children they have their own uh, group in which they can interact work and then produce something uh, interesting creative something that the child does himself that learning remains with the child forever so i usually talk about uh, aha moment aha moment is when the feeling of satisfaction feeling of happiness that the child gets after doing that work that learning remains with the child forever for a very very long time so here the child is expected to do the research work that the teacher has given so it's it's basically it's designed by the teacher in such a manner that a child covers the milestones from time to time and teacher keeps a regular communication on she is always looking into the work uh, and following it up because teacher is the one who knows where the child will take this project to what will be the learning outcome so from time to time there are some rubrics there are some milestones to be followed so it can be a combination of different activities that a teacher has designed for or uh, maybe uh, the steps of a process involved so the teacher has to see and then guide the child so that the gap is minimized this is uh, when i say the gap is minimized means every child ultimately has to reach to the learning outcomes or the objectives that the teacher had already laid so while executing the child also knows okay this was the gap and this is how i have to do by teacher's intervention teacher is coming in in between but letting the child research himself or herself and then execute so uh, when the first milestone is uh, achieved now the teacher is observing so there is no possibility that child has got the project made by someone from outside earlier when we were giving marks only on the end product that time we were not really sure if this fine work that has come to us was actually done by the student or was uh, actually not done by the student so in this process if student a gets a grade and student b gets b grade then maybe in the second milestone it is possible that the result changes now this experiment was done in dts sahibabad wherein we did uh, this exercise across many classes 
so i'll just um, in many classes actually all the classes we did but in the manual we've added for few classes now what uh, here the child children were doing and what our aim was being uh, a teacher we ultimately come to the assessment so if this project takes two weeks it this project takes three weeks what about my curriculum what about my syllabus to be covered so uh, uh, a very interesting uh, answer is that while performing this project the child covers two to three chapters of various subjects various disciplines so uh, your uh, curriculum your project is being taken care of now another interesting way is that the child is assessing himself child is not only assessing himself but is also being assessed by uh, the peer and teacher of course you are there to assess every minute every time so the, this is another now uh, we, we when we invited parents also to look into the projects the execution of the projects and see what end result has come the parents were also equally excited to see what the child has done and uh, they appreciated the way because uh, they were not involved usually when a project comes and it is uh, some of the parents they uh, come and share their observation ma'am this project was not for the child but was for me or for the mama so mother was busy throughout doing this project here the difference is not the mother is doing the project but the child has done even if the end product that we see is not that beautiful but that's okay the learning has happened so our purpose is that the learning happens now the triangular uh, assessment that was done was also assessed and supported by the assessment by parents the uh, we had because this was all online this year so this online work was all recorded and then sent to two different schools we we were making our own result assessment we have to give marks we are teachers so we were doing that now uh, this uh, work of the children with rubrics was given to different schools and that's how uh, it is planned to be done these different schools they looked into they went through the work of the children and the end product also the process also because everything is can be recorded uh, online so then they gave marks on the rubrics and then we added all the three results and then tried to find whether if the, these three four chapters that we had to cover otherwise through assessment through pen paper test then uh, that time the learning would have been better or now the learning has been better we took a written test also after teaching through pbl we took a written test also like any other chapter any other ways when the chapter is done through our uh, different pedagogies or any any pedagogy for that matter the regular uh, tests that we do so we realized that they were almost at par the results were very close to each other what does that indicate it simply indicates that this pedagogy was successful was able to give equal results in terms of marks but in terms of learning better learning had happened and the satisfaction that children had the aha moments that they had they made them learn it forever for a longer time so pbl uh, is a pedagogy that is interesting and child driven student driven interesting one to uh, do and i'm any time available in case your school anyone any one of you you want to do it i'll be happily um, uh, coming in and helping you out in case you want to execute it thank you thank you yogita ma'am i know that and when you say that i am available
when you say that i am available i am uh, i know that you mean it from the heart because whenever you have done sessions for us you have stayed with those groups and you have mentored them like a true guide i mean not leaving them just like that after the session so we are uh, my heartfelt gratitude for whatever sessions you have done for our educators and uh, i am sure with uh, since you are working so closely with cbc we will get to know more about these methods that you are closely Perfect. researching it especially because you are implementing this in your school and uh, we had such great session and uh, as you said you are there always with us so thank you so much for this session thank you sir and uh, uh, may i now invite uh, next speaker pooja bose ma'am pooja bose ma'am is the principal of she is the principal of the indian at the high range school in mumbai in kerala and she was earlier the principal of uh, kr mangalam in noida and dps noida etc so uh, we are glad to have her she also a cbc resource fund does a lot of sessions so i'm glad that she is here to conduct this session for us good evening mr matthews and a uh, very warm good evening to all the fellow principals and the topic of my talk today would be involving the stakeholders in education but before i touch upon that topic i'm happy to note that most of the previous principals have talked about new changes or the transformational changes in pedagogies in perspectives in our culture of teaching and learning per se which has led us to imbibe and adopt things like uh, project based learning toy pedagogy or storytelling now as we all understand fellow educators that none of us were schooled in this manner we were all we are all byproducts of very traditional methods of learning and teaching we haven't seen really all these pedagogical techniques being uh, you know uh, uh, implemented on us as students so therefore it is important for us to unlearn the way we have learned and learn the new techniques of teaching and learning having said that it's easier said than done because when we are trained to teach in a certain manner for us to teach in any other way becomes quite a challenge and therefore comes the importance of teacher training the new education policy has spoken a great deal about how teacher is at the center at the epicenter or at the core of this entire transformational process so this entire policy and its vision will fracture or will fail if we fail to empower and train our teachers so therefore none of us can negate the importance of teacher training we also understand that teacher training or teacher learning has to be an ongoing process because education is dynamic the entire landscape of education around the world keeps on changing but it has changed over the past one year so fast that it's difficult to keep pace with the changes in our education system covid-19 has only acted as a catalyst to all this change but they were round the corner always so therefore we need to now recognize that it's high time that we train our teachers we have to apply the new knowledge we have to apply the new techniques and the two the person who is going to apply all of that and make it a success is the teacher therefore the teacher needs to change her way her style of working we also understand that the students achieve 
the student's success is highly dependent on the teaching quality and the school leadership. So these are the two very important factors in teaching and learning and also the success of a student in the classroom and outside. So therefore, there's a change which we need to bring about overall in our system. Now, new education policy has also brought attention to the fact that the desired learning outcomes have changed. And how have they changed? Earlier, the importance the school had to culminate into getting a good seat in college. That is getting into college and then ultimately job readiness. But is that the only aim of education? As we see very clearly that the degree of the students, what they have achieved, through the, through the degrees and the, the, and the diplomas is really not a criteria and not, not an indicator and a guarantee that the child will be successful. So what is actually lacking? Where is it that the child is unable to succeed even after scoring good marks in schools and colleges? Obviously, that important gap which was missing were the life skills which has been recognized by the new education policy. And therefore, teaching of life skills has become an important area in our curriculum. Not only that, teaching of life skills cannot be th through theory. We have time and again been hearing terms like experiential learning, multidisciplinary approaches, art integrated learning, storytelling. And what are these actually? These are nothing but tools, mediums to teach life skills to our students. So therefore, teacher training has to have all these components. There has to be a curriculum of teacher training, not only at the national level, but also at the state level, at the district level. So at every level, teacher training has to be implemented. Where are which are the areas where teacher training will you know will happen? Some of the areas will be obviously the effective implementation of national education policy. Dear friends, NEP when it was introduced, the previous NEP, or for that matter, 1968, the Kothari Commission, all of them were highly progressive. All of them were highly transformational. But somewhere where they all lag was the implementation part. That although the document per se was very progressive, forward looking, but we could not implement it successfully to some extent. CCE also was highly transformational. It was very, very modern, contemporary in its approach but we could not implement it so well. And one of the major reasons why we were unable to do it in letter and spirit was the lack of teacher training across the country. So therefore effective implementation of the new education policy is possible only through teacher training. When we talk about early childhood care and education, another very important area where teachers have to be trained Teachers have to be educated about the importance of this pillar of a child's life. What would be bagless days looking like? Unless we have a thorough and we dissect each element of bagless days, ECCE, with the teachers, we thrash it out with the teachers, this approach will not be able to they will not be able to fairly understand the approaches which are being talked about. We haven't done well in PISA scores. And how will we do better? Will be possible only through teacher trainings. And of course, art integration, interdisciplinary approaches, all of these things have to happen only when the teacher is educated, when the teacher is empowered, when the teacher feels confident that yes, she is now ready and prepared 
to implement all of this in the system of school. NCTE has, there is talk about disbandoning NCTE. And there is also talk about teacher education or teacher training during the, during the B.Ed. Uh, level to be, you know, in a multidisciplinary institution of higher learning. So standalone B.Ed colleges will now be, you know, will not be promoted anymore now. All the aspects, the important part here is the quality and the competence of teachers, which will, which will improve only if the quality and competence of teacher trainers improve. I hope you all will agree with me. So now teacher trainers, how do we get better teacher trainers is now the vital question. Most of the teacher training in schools happen in a very, very, you know, uh, rustic manner. We generally uh, do not give very serious thought about teacher training. First, we have to recognize what are the gaps in our school, which are the areas where teacher training is necessary. And every school is different in that way. It has to be customized to every school. That is point number one. The second point is that the teacher training cannot be just extrinsic. That is, you can't you can't outsource teacher training altogether. There has to be a dual approach that it has to be internal as well as external. And the third would be that we need to have multiple follow-ups of the training programs. And when follow-ups, I would use the term continuous professional development. So what happens in general as we see, and I'm not talking about your school or my school, in general, we generally put teacher training programs at the beginning of the session or just after a vacation or, or just at the end of the session. However, that's not how it should be, you know, looked into. Teacher training has to be a continuous process. And the area in which you are you are beginning to train the teacher should be followed up properly through class observations, through brainstorming sessions, etc., cetera, etc. Cetera. So, fifty hours of teacher training that is continuous professional development of teachers for fifty hours per year is being given in the new education policy, but the fifty hours will be immaterial if the quality of teacher training is not good. So here I would like to also flag to you that we need to monitor the quality of teacher training, the relevance of teacher training, the meaning of teacher training. And it will happen through public-private partnership only. That means we will have certainly some private teacher trainers and we will also have some government uh, trainers provided by CBSC, but it has to be a good handshake between the two, which will lead to the success of our education system. Because we are looking at global approaches. We are looking at international level of education. So we must factor in the upgradation of teachers. We must factor in that familiarity with the early learning goals. What are the learning goals? new education policy. Let's get familiar with that through teacher training. Let's get more uh, comfortable activity-based learning or game-based learning. So these are some things which we have to get comfortable with, not just in terms of thinking about them, but how practicing them very well in the classroom. With the new education policy 2020, our mindsets have changed. How we at the goals of education has changed. So their pedagogies have changed. The way we are supposedly going to assess our children, that has changed. How to unlearn the traditional approaches and learn the ones that has changed. So it's a, it's a big Herculean task at hand. So we need to look into that. And a complete overall is the only result, is the only aim, is the only way towards success. Follow-up of each teacher training is necessary. And now I come to the second more neglected area, which is parents. When I say teacher training, I think it's also important to adopt an approach of parent training. 
Why do I say so? Because most of the parents like us have also been taught in a certain way. They have studied in a certain way. They also believe I'm not talking about the metros. I'm not talking about the educated elite parents. I'm talking about an average parent in a remote town of this country. That parent believes that the child has to go to school to get good marks exams. That parent does not believe in spending too much time or effort, investing too much of effort in activities. We, we keep on experiencing such parents time and again. So I think that a program for parent training also should be put in place so that the attitude towards education, school education, higher education changes. That degrees are not standalone, not the only important things. What is important is also the fact that the child thinks independently, thinks critically, is able to analyze, is confident, is a good team player. These things are as necessary as good marks in examinations. Another area where parents need to be trained uh, is the socio-emotional aspect, which parents generally do not understand why the child, despite look, being looked after, is not able to blossom in his personality. So the social emotional aspects, the training in that area, parent education in that area is also, I feel, necessary. The parents, on an average, feels that no need to go to a counselor, no need to go to a therapist. It's a matter of shame. That perspective, those attitudes need to change. So therefore, I would say that in order to align our entire school system, which includes teachers, students, parents, we need to have more training sessions with all of them. The parents' orientation towards examination, towards assessment, towards project-based learning, everything will be successful if we spend ample time in talking to the parents, conversing with the parents, having dialogues with the parents, and in other words, training them and aligning them towards these new approaches. And with this, we, we are, I'm very confident that we'll be successful in a year from now in at least changing the attitudes of the masses. Last but not the least, I think technology has to be tamed. Technology has to be befriended. So therefore, when we I talk about training, training the teachers to be more tech savvy through technology only is the approach. So it's possible now. We see it. I'm talking to all of you. Somebody is in Kuwait. Somebody is in Saibabad. But then it's the technology which has become our biggest friend. Earlier, we were trying to sideline it. We were trying to, you know, it's, it's not good to give a smartphone to the child. But now suddenly every child has a personal smartphone. So that's, that's how time changes our thoughts, our perspectives, our needs have changed. So therefore it's only natural that we need to align ourselves. We need to change our attitudes. We need to train our mind to think better. Thank you so much. Thank you so much, uh, Pooja ma'am, for those wonderful thoughts that you have uh, shared with us. Involving stakeholders, that is something very, uh, I think it's a need of the hour because especially with the new education policy coming in, uh, the, all the stakeholders need to be, because many of the schools are very reluctant to bring in all the stakeholders. Uh, and uh, you said about teacher training, which is so essential because unless the teachers are trained, we can't create happy classrooms. Uh, learning has to be a very joyful experience, right? So uh, I, I'm glad that you brought about this point about involving all the people who are involved with education, the parents, the students themselves, the teachers, the management. And unless we work hand in hand, uh, things will never improve. So thank you so much, Pooja ma'am, for sparing your valuable time. It's always a great pleasure to have you with us. And thank you once again. Uh, our next uh, uh, speaker is Archana Rodriguez, ma'am, uh, who is the principal of St. Joseph's Mumbai. And she is also conducting a lot of sessions for us. Thank you, Archana, ma'am, for joining us. And as I said, she is uh, 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 she's recently elected as the president of the Private Unaided School Management Association. So we also congratulate her on this great achievement of being elected as the first lady president, I believe. <laughs> so uh, great, great uh, achievement. Congratulations. And uh, 
uh, all our best wishes and uh, today i am glad that you are able to share some uh, time of yours in understanding see the basic problem in our schools that we face is that we are having uh, students uh, a classroom of 40 to 50 students and uh, uh, we are all teaching in the same way <laughs> although it's a heterogeneous group our methods are homogeneous so can you suggest some methods by which we can tackle this problem Archana ma'am I think being a special educator and something which is very close to art I think you are the best person to deal with this subject thank you sir for inviting me today good evening to one and all and to all the wonderful speakers today and to the audience uh, thank you for uh, calling me today and uh, I hope that uh, my 10 minutes uh, would be of some use to each and every one who's listening to me today. Uh, today, I'm reminded of this uh, line by William Shakespeare, which is a very simple line, which says that we know what we are now, but we don't know where will we, what we will be later. So it is exactly what we are in uh, right now, uh, post-COVID, or I would say not yet post-COVID, but very soon, the post-COVID period, uh, would be very, very uh, different for us. And today in my 10 minute session, I hope I can convince each and every one of you over here that it is going to be a positive change for us. Uh, all over the world, worldwide education systems are very, very urgently recalibrating themselves. They are absolutely understanding that some of the education systems worldwide are uh, outdated. So this uh, post pandemic, uh, would be uh, can be turned into a advantageous situation for us. It can be like a watershed event which can uh, give rise to a very resilient and a very sustainable and a very inclusive education setup in the near future. It's true that uh, every uh, crisis uh, comes with its own set of responsibilities, comes with its own set of also opportunities. And here I can see opportunities for transformation opportunities for transformation, opportunities for bringing about change, because without change, uh, we don't really survive. Change is intrinsic to survival. So uh, that is why I feel that uh, once this pandemic gets over, it's like, uh, it's like the human brain. Once the human brain is stretched like an elastic, it never goes back to its original dimensions is what I strongly believe in. So now that we have stretched ourselves to accommodate each and every child to accommodate and take the blended learning, the hybrid learning and all the creatives that we are doing, uh, including going global in terms of being online, I think uh, it's very important to understand that we are never going back to what we were earlier. So that's a positive for me. We are never going back to just a regular classroom setup, we are definitely going to have a lot of hybrid methods of teaching, a lot of very, very creative methods of teaching. Uh, before uh, I take you through what I feel can be done at this post-COVID period to accommodate each and every child, uh, let me also uh, share with you what I recently read up about the World Education Forum. Uh, what it has uh, uh, estimated is that uh, the current students who are going to school currently are facing a backlog of almost $10 trillion in terms of their earnings, which they would have made had pan the pandemic not come in. And already uh, the World Education Forum has uh, estimated uh, around one fifth of the world's population, the young people uh, are already unemployed. And uh, with this unemployment, we also have the very daunting picture of 1.3 billion young people 1.3 billion young people who are going to grow into adulthood into the employability age within the next coming decade. So all the more reason for us to understand that outdated methods of teaching, outdated methods of education and systems that we are using can at least that should not be the barrier for the future learners, for these future leaders, for these future uh, uh, generation who are going to suffer if we don't uh, look at our education system, if we don't look at the curriculum, if we don't evaluate. So the changes need to happen, not just in terms of the differentiated classroom setup that we are looking at, but it's also in terms of restructuring the time that we are uh, giving uh, to the child, having flexibility in terms of restructuring the time. The teacher roles have changed. No longer are we givers of information. Everything is available on the, uh, on the smartphones. 
children are easily uh, able to access whatever information they want so we are no longer uh, uh, like banks of information we have to become mentors we have to become facilitators and we have to be guides so the role of the teacher has also changed it has the the, the teaching methodology has to become more student centric in the sense the child decides how or when in what manner he or she can learn and the nep has helped us in this in a great manner but just putting an, an nep into practice will not be the thing each and every one of us has to consider uh, looking at the curriculum what are those essential skills that we wish our children to remember several years down the line uh, what are the facts and processes that we are teaching them that we want them to remember down the line how relevant is it and looking at that uh, we look at the curriculum we look at uh, the uh, how we are delivering the curriculum so uh, when we understand uh, uh, that all these things uh, considering we need to look at each and every child as an individual entity right and this concept that we have of differentiated learning is absolutely not a new concept let me be very clear on that uh, this became extremely famous in the year 2001 Uh, in the us when when an act was passed which uh, which spoke about uh, which said no child uh, left behind uh, wherein the learning gaps of the children were addressed uh, uh, they they felt that uh, you know each and every child should be well accommodated there should be equity in the classrooms very soon uk followed with another uh, a concept of uh, every child matters so not surprisingly the nep also has these concepts taken in into uh, 2020 when the nep came in it was a welcome uh, welcome and it was a, uh, a welcome move and it was highly highly overdue uh, because the most important factors in nep if i can uh, uh, just uh, tell it to you in a nutshell is flexibility and differentiation when we talk about flexibility you know enough flexibility and enough uh, webinars have been conducted on uh, nep so i would not go into the flexibility aspect of it wherein the child can choose uh, just let me put it in a nutshell for you it's like moving from a buffet fixed menu to an a la carte menu wherein your uh, uh, the child does not have to necessarily take what is fixed in the menu he or she can decide and pick and choose and tailor make what he or she has to have how to consume so uh, that's the flexibility which came in uh, in the nep now secondly the most important thing wa what was brought about is the differentiated learning aspect now this again is not a new concept it's been uh, followed all over the world but yes for us uh, it's very difficult with the kind of numbers that we cater to in class now differentiated learning is a broad concept which has many aspects of inclusion nep speaks highly about inclusion very very much in depth about inclusion about equity about having a sustainable process and most importantly about the transformational assessment methods that we need to follow because we have to move from the rote learning methodology to evaluating how a child wants to present his information how he or she would want to present that information so here again the teacher's role changes no uh, in terms of how he or she is able to uh, cater to the child now differentiation is nothing nothing other than the a teacher giving due importance and due consideration to each and every child's learning needs now each and every child's learning needs who are similar to the learning styles now just like we all of us have fingerprints which are not similar Uh, each and every child or each and every individual each and every one of us has a different learning style i mean enough has been said about the learning style but uh, there are various methods which is uh, for special educators we speak about the vakt which is visual auditory kinesthetic and tactile then there is a vark which is visual auditory reading writing and kinesthetic i am a kinesthetic learner i know i cannot sit in one place and speak so we it's important for us to understand what type of or speak or talk or read i have to move around so a kinesthetic learner would move around some children learn be best with auditory hearing the lessons some people learn uh, visually it's important for the teacher to understand these difficulties and now in this post covid period like none never before are we actually realizing that every class is different the group dynamics in every class is different when we went online uh we realize that okay some children you would not believe are learning very well in the online setup 
because they like the the change and they like the freedom that the online setup gives some children are restless because they don't want to sit in front of the screens so each and every child is different and never before have we woken up to the fact that we are catering to a totally heterogeneous group so definitely our teaching cannot be homogeneous it has to be heterogeneous it has to be different it has to be adapted to the group that we are catering to so it's very uh, necessary for a for a teacher to understand that learners differ on various fronts uh, most importantly obviously the learners differ in terms of their interest the learners as in the students each one is interested in something else now for example even the capability and the learning readiness of children are different uh, for example a teacher takes a bat and a ball to class uh, and expects like say 35 children in the class okay you're all going to hit the ball with the bat uh, do you think each and every one will do a similar job of it it's next to impossible i mean every child would be having a different way of holding the bat or hitting the ball it, it's going to be very different i mean you cannot have a one size fits all approach any longer what we, we what anyone would say this is what we have been doing for ages but sorry it is not possible now just because you have been doing this for ages it's no longer going to work so we look at how the learner is different from each other so the readiness part of it how we talk about reading readiness we talk about writing readiness we speak about different readiness skills the child has so each child comes to the class with a different set of readiness skills then there's an the interest factor like you you are uh, in the uh, when you want to change the process it is like how interested is the child is in what you are saying so how can you modify what you are saying to generate more interest we we heard the pedagogies of toy pedagogy and story how can you make how can you incorporate these things to ensure that every child is interested apart from this most importantly the learners who come to our class differ in terms of their profiles their learning profiles uh, their their experiences that they have the past learnings that they have the attention span that they have how long can they sit in one place how long how much of uh, reading have they done in the past uh, what is the language that they are comfortable in what is the culture that they are coming from all these uh, learning profiles are different from each and every for every child so let me again uh, clarify here that differentiated learning is not individualized i'm not saying that you need to have an individual curriculum for each and every child who comes into your class what we looking at is to understand the teachers need to understand the learning styles and the learning needs are different so therefore she has to have a constant set of activities which can help so the nep has given us this flexibility uh in terms of making this kind of change in our uh, not only in the in the delivery of the cu curriculum but also in terms of what curriculum we are going to teach how relevant is that how we are going to deliver so when we are looking at uh, initiating uh, uh differentiated learning into the classrooms uh, there are various ways in which we, uh, uh, we can do this but for me i would just give you three quick methods since uh, we don't have much time here uh, maybe you could remember it as three p's one is a person one is the process and one is a product so looking at the person we look at the child as a person what is the learning need of the child what is the learning style of the child considering the the various theories that we have learned most importantly the multiple intelligences howard gardner's we need every teacher needs to understand that to ex uh, accept that every child who comes into a class is capable of something or the other no child comes with zero capabilities so keeping that into consideration keeping the learner as the center giving him the choice to voice what he wants that's important uh, secondly it is uh, the process the process in which you take your teaching methodology what is the process that you can follow for example uh, you want the child to write an argumentative essay on uh, say the pandemic for example because that's the latest thing the child is not interested but you know that the child is maybe interested in football he stays up all night watching the football matches so all you have to teach is the steps on how to write what are the steps in order to write the, that essay and you change the topic for that child and you know because in cbse writing skills are very important so you just have to give the topic of interest to the child and believe me you'll be surprised how beautifully the child would rise to that occasion and rise to the challenge of writing an essay provided the topic is of interest to him 
So the process in which you do a particular activity can be modified. We can have team, small ability groups where uh, you can have a mixed ability group, or you can have uh, uh, coaches who help one another, like reading buddies. One child can read well, so he's reading for the other child. Whereas another child can enact well, so he's enacting. He's a kinesthetic learner, so he likes to enact. Or uh, uh, there is a visual learner who likes to look at images. So you combine the groups. Have, maybe have activity corners for every uh, topic. Maybe uh, in CBSC, of course, we have an upper uh, cap limit in terms of the number of students that we have in class. So it's very easily doable for us. So the process needs to be looked at. It's no longer the teacher giving the information and the child taking in and then having an MCQ uh, test at the end because MCQs also lead to a lot of guessing. It's not the best methods. Let me, it's not the best method to check a child's uh, understanding. And we are moving because of the NEP, we are moving from rote learning to understanding, remember. So MCQs, again, going back to the rote learning method. You just have to remember. And a lot of guesswork. People, Children are very good at guesswork. The third P would be the product. Now, this is very important because that is what finally determines what the child does with what he or she has learned, the assessment. So how are you going to expect the child to tell you whether he or she has understood what you have done? What is the assessment pattern? And assessments have to be periodic. Someone said that as today's assessment is the blueprint for tomorrow's lesson plan. So when you are doing differentiated learning, from the lesson planning stage itself, the planning has to go in such a manner that we take these three P's into consideration, the person, the process, and the product. Once you have put this into your planning session, into your lesson plan, that there is no way that this uh, differentiated learning cannot be delivered in each and every class. It's important for us to move from where we are to somewhere where we can understand that, yes, every child has tremendous potential. Now, finally, it all boils down to, uh, boils down to a change in the institution's mindset that every child is important, every child is precious, every child matters, and not just the few uh, the, the, the few uh, smart ones or the super achievers who get uh, like you know above 90 in the class. Every child matters. So that is very important. And it also boils down to every teacher's capabilities or their uh, readiness to go that extra mile in every lecture, in every period, every class, every day, every year, year after year. And it's also the principal's conviction, the school principal's conviction that, yes, my teachers can cater to this, be more creative in the way, uh, ensure that each and every child is catered to in the class. If the principal is convinced about it, then she can surely be a mentor and a motivator to her team of teachers. And uh, uh, that that will that willingness and the determination of the leader is what finally will take this whole process uh, forward. In the words of Mahatma Gandhi, who said that the strength is uh, not just uh, you know your physical capability; it's also your indomitable spirit, your indomitable will. So let's become very strong in our willpower to ensure that each and every child is catered to in the class. Each and every learning style is understood by our teachers and the same is taken forward by them in terms of the content delivery that they do. So uh, I hope that uh, in the near future, once NEP comes into practice, uh, we move from where we were, uh, uh, you know, like uh, yawns back in terms of our style of education and into a new uh, uh, setup where every child feels important, every child feels included, every child feels that, yes, I enjoy what I'm doing because I get to choose how I learn. Thank you very much. Matthew, sir. Yeah, thank you so much. Thank you, Archana, ma'am. <laughs> that was a wonderful, uh, short and sweet session. And you brought in so many parameters of how to, you know, take care of children. So many good examples. And I am sure uh, our educators who are listening have got a lot of ideas. And uh, they are going to treat each and every child matters. Such a beautiful sentence. Every child is so special. Every child is unique. And uh, we cannot uh, simply use homogeneous methods because there are different types of learners in our class. So thank you so much, uh, Archana ma'am, once again, uh, for uh, spending thank your you, valuable sir. time. And always, you have been always uh, ready to help us out with all the sessions. So on behalf of AIF, a big thanks to you. Thank you, sir. And, thank you. And next we have uh, Dr. Minakshi Narula. I mean, someone who is uh, really associated with uh, the All India Educators Forum for a very, very long time. And she's the principal of 
Shemford Futuristic K-12 School in Oreya. And she is the recipient of many, many innovative awards. And if you look at her Facebook page, every day she is going to attend courses. I mean, that's the, uh, the greatest thing which a teacher can do is to learn more. And she's the best example, I feel, of learning. Every day she's learning so much. The learning process is continuous for her. I mean, uh, every day I can see a bunch of certificates on her <laughs> Facebook page. So, ma'am, uh, we are delighted to have you uh, as a speaker today. Uh, and uh, you, uh, with all the innovative awards that you have got and uh, so many innovations that you have done in your school, we will be happy to know about uh, that in 2021, what do you think will be the major technological changes uh, that anyone can bring into the classroom or how should we tackle this year as compared to the regular things that were happening in the previous years? Dr. Minakshima. Thanks. Thanks a lot, uh, Matthew, sir, for, I mean, this much introduction, I don't deserve it, but still uh, you have explained, you have given a lot many, uh, I mean, to say explanation, the things about me, the different, uh, my teaching uh, passion, my learning passion. Uh, I mean, this is all about like i just want to see you three of you on the screen <laughs> two of you on the screen so then i should know i'm talking to somebody <laughs> this is technology you see first of all if i'm talking about technology i'm here i can see you i can talk to you this is technology certainly technology what are the benefits 2020 we can see that is a great reflection of this 2020 let's be all lifelong learners and how it can be possible like just learning from i mean others experience from our experience uh, just keep on learning whatever wherever you get a chance you should always learn and this technology integration when i'm talking about in 2020 i am the one who faced a lot of challenges in 2020 i had to you see teach my teachers I have to empower my team to take the classes online. And it was really very difficult. Very difficult because teachers who do not know how to use the computers, how to type and all this thing, and suddenly overnight, they have to take the classes online. It was very difficult. But talking about digital India, talking about NEP's Article 23, technology integration, so I took this challenge as a learning opportunity. Learning opportunity, not for me, but for my whole team, for my students, for my teachers, for the management, for everybody. So that says what technology. Certainly technology cannot uh, replace the great teachers, but technology in the hands of great teachers can really be transformational. This you can read everywhere. And this is 100% true. And how we made it possible? We teachers, now we are not only the facilitators, we have been changed to the co-learners. We are learning along with our students. We are learning from them. They know much more than us. They are very much advanced. So we have to learn how to use technology. How can it transform? Now, if I'm talking about why technology, Certainly, why technology? We have already uh, reflected on 2020. We know very well why technology. Had there been no technology, it would not have been possible for us to continue this learning during this pandemic for our students. This teaching learning would not have been possible during after uh, if we're talking about no technology. But today, what all speakers have said, starting from the first speaker, uh, Dr. T. Prem Kumarji, when he was talking about storytelling. See, technology has given a tool to the students to make their e-stories, comic strips, sway stories, and all. So technology in the hands of the students, guided by the teachers, so that can do wonders. Talking about puppetry, that kind of integration, the children, they can make their puppets, Plotagon, wonderful tool, the children, they can make and present their own puppets, own stories, and that could really be wonderful. Talking about art integration, again, we have having a lot many platforms to exhibit students' work. International collaboration, 
through technology it was possible during um, in this pandemic otherwise i mean it was very difficult everybody now got to know how to use smartphones everybody got to know how to use uh, you see what all de uh, devices they were available with the children if i'm talking about nep that talks about equity ma'am has already said talking about equity inclusive education technology when it gives us immersive reader for the specially able children so it is really very good microsoft tool immersive reader wonderful i mean i was amazed to see that kind of tools had that tools been at our age we could have done wonders we are not trying to do now it's our turn to guide our children to do the uh, use the technology in a wiser manner so this is what we all are doing now we are in age of education 5.0 education 5.0 where obviously the teachers they should not only be creating the parrots teachers should not act as the parrots also i mean just uh, i mean uh, making the children just memorize or uh, just regurgitate the information that they have learned but actually teachers should act as the researchers they should not be following whatever is given in the books and all they should come up with their own thoughts own ideas own research now how will this research be possible the more they learn the more they interact on these kind of such kind of platforms right i am very thankful to sir for giving such a wonderful platform to all of us i mean he has uh, given a lot of platforms to all of us i have been interacting with the teachers with the principal with my co teachers and have learned a lot from each and every person so this is a wonderful platform i would like to say to interact with each other to know more about each other so technology certainly it's really a transformational talking about educational 5.0 education 5.0 so it it is really a wonder now bridging the gap cross cultural gap we are knowing more about each other we are conducting virtual field trips where while sitting over here we can know about all over the world we recently conducted assemblies you see across the globe and my children they learned more about it they even shared their own ideas technology has given a wonderful platform as ma'am was already saying student voice and choice they have given a lot of lot many platforms they can go for if they are as per their learning styles if they are linguistics reading and writing they can go for blogs if they are very much expresses the vlogs are there so wonderful i mean they can speak there are podcast available i have listened to even search podcast many a time wonderfully explained now it it comes to the students like which platform they want to choose number of platforms are available for the students to choose so actually technology has done learning any time anywhere any irrespective of place irrespective of time ha huh. as and when you have time you can join any of the courses across the globe and enhance your skills so nowadays this era is of blended learning blended approach art integration technology integration now how come it is feasible blended approach certainly with the help of technology but i would certainly say our classrooms they are not changing that much as the environment around we have we are seeing continuously a lot of changes in our environment every day there is a change every minute there is a change look at our classrooms the sitting arrangement the classrooms the same blackboard the same chalk the same seating pattern sitting in a rows and columns all those children there is no creativity there is no innovation we need to look into it that kind of i mean now how to uh, this integrate technology it should not just substitute i mean to say just right now i'm talking to you instead of a face to face talk right now i'm talking to you through this platform the digital platform this would just be a substitution like we should not be going for the substitution part of technology integration our uh, this thing i just uh, give you one example like for example if i am uh, i am teaching something to my students in the classroom that is a journal thing i'm i'm taking some media to teach that is a substitution if uh, just uh, to make this maybe conversation more effective more impressive if i will be using a video if i'll be using a powerpoint 
that will be just a little bit augmentation. Now, if I will be using some another tool to maybe uh, create a mind map, some kind of thing to explain, to use my ideas, that would be a little bit more modification. But our objective is to reach the redefinition level where the children, they should be able to use their own uh, strategies. They should be able to think which tool to use. They have got number of tools wherever they are good at as per their learning style. Like I have already informed number of uh, platforms are available as per their learning styles. They can go for writing. They can go for uh, obviously typing. They can go for voiceover. They can be YouTubers. They can be, they can be, I mean to say, uh, uh, plotigons. They can, uh, I mean, create their stories, comic strips, what not. Technology is just wonderful, but should be used wisely and in the right manner. Now, challenges, certainly. I would have number of challenges as I had earlier. More number of students, uh, I mean, maybe in a class and the, the teachers, they are not having resources. So we have to empower the teachers too. We have to, in, uh, I mean, uh, arrange for the online sessions, maybe physical session, face-to-face -face sessions to empower our teachers, to let them know how to use the technology. It may not be possible for each and every teacher to go for expensive courses. Thanks to CBSA, it is arranging number of courses for all the teachers at very nominal price. Everybody can afford even the schools they can sponsor as well. I am doing from my school, I'm sponsoring all my teachers to go for the CBSC or maybe other sessions. So this is what we have to come forward as a pedagogical leader. We need to come forward. We need to support those who are unable to I mean, participate looking at their own pocket. So this is what we can do for the community. Let us all together have some sessions, community outreach sessions for those who cannot afford, but who have the passion of learning so let us all together make this mission possible like of digital india making this nep article 23 technology integration equity and inclusion possible for all of us let india let i mean to say we all of us as indians come shine everywhere globally and even i would like to say as world as one family Vasudev Kutumbakam. Let's all share whatever we learn. As Sarah has initially said, like, uh, I mean, it's not like that I uh, showcase my certificates to, I mean, to, to boast, I'm learning so much. But let me tell you, whenever I post any one certificate, number of people, they enroll for the same course. It inspires them. So this is my objective, aspire to inspire. Let's all complete accomplish this noble cause. Thank you, sir. Thank you so much. Thank you so much, Minakshi, ma'am. And uh, uh, so beautifully, you are inspiring so many people to join these courses because, you know, they always feel that, okay, principal is attending, so <laughs> we should also attend. So you are leading from the front. I would say you are a very dynamic uh, principal and you are leading from the front. You are an example to all the educators of what learning is all about. Otherwise, after 10 years, 20 years, 30 years, Teachers tend to relax and say, I have done my job. Now I don't want to learn any further. So, but, and so when you are showing this and you're speaking about this, I think you have done a great job of uh, inspiring so many educators to learn further. Thank you so much, Minakshi. Uh, just for would like to, just would ah, like to yes, say one thing. I mean to say when, yes, yes. I mean to say when I'm sharing these thoughts with you on this wonderful platform, at least I would like to say through my words, through my talk, through my deliberation, at least one person should definitely be inspired and that obviously one is me and there would there can be many more <laughs> and yeah, it yeah. is certainly so wonderful and i'm going to say it's god's grace and i am really very always thankful to god he has given me an opportunity as and when it is possible for me i do sponsor my teachers to learn if it is not possible somehow because of they are not able to do i learn for them Mother Oti, mother learns sometimes for the child and then explain. I learn for them. I myself have attended 1000 plus workshops during this pandemic. Out of it, 250 plus CBSC sessions. And you see uh, four Cambridge programs I have attended, IB programs. And it was just a wonderful, great learning journey. I've explored a lot. I mean, number of things I have learned. And thanks to 
Matthew, sir. I mean, <laughs> that the first session I attended, I attended with Mr. Matthew, and then the learning continued. Thank you, sir. So, so you are a, just say if if I am allowed to talk in Hindi, you are a bhandar of knowledge now. So it's it's good that uh, so many people are getting inspired. So thank you, Minakshi Ma'am, for those nice words and uh, always getting associated with our programs. And uh, now we have Mridula Ma'am, Mridula Mahajan Ma'am. Uh, nice to have you back. We had some issues in the beginning, so we would love to hear from you. As I had introduced Mridula Ma'am. Uh, uh, those who have joined in late, Mridula Ma'am is the principal of Dr. D. Y. Patel School in Pune, and uh, she is a sports person. She is a national level softball and uh, uh, cricket player. So it's a it's an honor and privilege that a person who of national standing is coming and talking to us. And uh, uh, we and she's uh, speaking on the importance of sports and toys in the learning pedagogy. So over to you, Mridula Ma'am. Thank you, Matthew sir, and thank you all the audience for your patience. Uh, it was wonderful listening to all the speakers. A lot has been said there about NEP, and I would continue on the same line. So NEP seeks to break the dogma. NEP is trying to do something new or in a different way. Like Archana ma'am rightly said, the ideas may not be new, but the implementation level that was missed out, the execution that was missed out is now wonderfully happening. So let's talk about toy pedagogy. And before I say anything else, toy pedagogy is something that all psychologists and educationists, including the great Rabindranath Tagore, have advocated and propagated. Now, why toy pedagogy? Because play is something that comes naturally to students. Play is something that children are very fond of. It helps them to create and to construct. It helps them to go into a world of their own. And that is something they enjoy. So coming to the next terminology, joyful learning or stress-free learning. This is exactly what toy pedagogy does. And so toy pedagogy now is very important as per NEP and otherwise also. So this is to involve students in a constructive way, in a good way and in a better way. Now, what are the benefits? Some of the benefits. Example, educational implication, language development. When you use toys in the class or when children use toys for learning and teaching in the teaching learning process, what happens is increase in vocabulary. Next, like I said, creativity, 21st century skills. So creativity, discovery learning, these are the necessary skills, critical thinking, necessary skill as per 21st century, which are developed among the students. I would not stop at saying that just use toys for teaching existing toys for teaching, but in the other levels, in the advanced levels, let us for one minute, the preparatory stage and the foundation stage is there. But in the higher secondary, can students create their own toys? These toys which will help to understand the Indian culture, the Indian lineage, the Indian heritage also, our traditions and customs also. And when we say toys, it is not only about games. It's a vast, vast topic. Toys include everything right from rattles, the utensils, that is Batukli, the miniature kitchen utensils, the board games like chess, snakes and ladders, business world, outdoor games like Gilli Danda, Appar Appi or Seven Tiles, walking toys, moving toys, spring toys, drum toys, gravitational toys, and spinning toys like the spinning top or the firki. Even puppets, all the varieties of puppets, the sock puppet, the hand puppet, the finger puppet, the stick puppet, all these fall under the category of toys. Not to forget dolls and the way you dress them up. Now, isn't it beautiful? Yes, it is. And toys have a long, long history. It all started, as we know, even during the Indus Valley civilization. It is from there that we have learned about toys, clay toys, wooden toys. And how do we use them? You can easily combine it with story pedagogy. So if you use a soft toy to talk about a tiger or a fairy, the story becomes all the more interesting. What about mathematical and scientific toys? Yes, they help and go a long way in getting clarity in the concept formation. Besides this, because it is something that comes naturally and it is enjoyable, so the other advantage is that the memory and retention improves. 
टुडे ऑल ऑफ अस आर टॉकिंग अबाउट द रिड्यूसिंग अटेंशन स्पैन द डिमिनिशिंग अटेंशन स्पैन बट इफ टॉय पेडोगॉजी इज यूज वॉट हैपन्स इज चिल्ड्रन एंजॉय लर्निंग and this helps them to continue working for long hours this helps them to be in a habit of completing their tasks and this is one of the biggest advantages according to me apart from this a positive impact is created entertainment recreation value is there and also motor skills fine motor skills are developed so toy pedagogy my friends is very useful is very fruitful and also let us not forget that toy pedagogy includes the gaming sector our prime minister narendra modi ji when he spoke in man ki baat in august 2020 he mentioned that games should be created by indians artificial intelligence coding this sort of toys and games should be created and manufactured by indians which will inspire the indian culture the indian folk tales also should be showcased by way of these toys and these games so that is all about toy pedagogy let me move ahead to one more step talk about nep ek bharat shreshtha bharat the concept that has come from cbsc let me give you an example for example maharashtra is paired with orissa so if i tell you which is the national which is the state bird of maharashtra and the state bird of orissa make a puppet or a soft toy see how beautifully it can be blended and integrated with various subjects let's talk about the balloon as a toy when you blow a balloon what happens to the air when you release the air what happens which scientific concept is learned over here we all know about fairs this is the time when lot of fairs happen all over india and there's one toy which is sold in the fair that is the toy which creates bubbles soap water and where bubbles are created is it possible to teach a scientific concept what about the pinhole camera these what about the kaleidoscope what about the periscope these are toys and projects which will fall under toy pedagogy and really help us to make our teaching learning process better not to forget that creating toys could be taken up as a profession also it could be included in vocational education Modi ji has already mentioned that it has a market of 7 lakh crores so let us look at toy making also let us let us look at it from a different perspective altogether i would conclude by saying that toy pedagogy will help in making the teaching learning process more interesting and i'll move ahead to sports integrated learning sports integrated learning my friends is just like another way of making learning and teaching interesting but why is it essential again let me talk about two programs implemented by the government of india along with sai the sports authority of india and also with cbsc one is the fit india movement we all know about fit india movement because we've celebrated the fit india school week we also know about cyclothon and other events and the other is khelo india now under khelo india we are expected to have battery of tests for all our students students have been grouped into two age groups one 5 to 8 that is class 1 to 3 and the other one 9 to 18 that is class 5 to 12 and there are three battery of tests for the lower age group and five for the higher age group now why are we doing this this is to create a benchmark for indian students this is to find out what is the strength the fitness the well being the mental health health as well as the physical health of the indian students and the indian fellow men this will set a benchmark as to what should be the height and the weight of student of a 5 a 5 year old or a 6 year old or a 7 year old and this will help us to achieve a lot in terms of sports but why did we do this why did we think of integrating it why are we thinking of sports not as co scholastic but as scholastic now why has it become equally important yes because physical activity is the key to the success of a nation archana man already said that india is one of the youngest countries and if we have to have our youth to contribute in the global scenario they should be healthy they should be fit and therefore it has to all begin from the school days now sports integration doesn't only mean the physical activity 
that is definitely one aspect but sports has to be integrated with other subjects let's take up an example what if the students are taken to a football ground and the mathematics teacher and pe teacher team together to teach them the size of the ground what is the length and the breadth and how to find out the perimeter and the area what is the angle from which the player shot the goal how did the goal miss was it because of the wrong angle was it because of the speed was it because of the distance so mathematical concepts can be explained on the ground through pe this is one of the examples let us take another example what about integrating pe or sports activity with science when we talk about good food people often say rich food which is incorrect it is about balanced diet and not just rich diet so balanced diet is required for sports for a sports person and the science teacher is in a better position to explain this again vocations like being a sports person being a sports counselor being a sports psychologist being a sports therapist are all open if sports integration happens during the school days and my friends let me give you statistics which is based on research millions of deaths happen in the world because of non communicable diseases but the reason for these non communicable diseases is not anything else but lack of physical activity and physical activity can never come in a pill exercise doesn't come in a pill and so sports integration should be there should be implemented right from school days to have fit india i think in the given time uh, this is all that i should be speaking i'm extremely sorry my apologies for the audio problem thank you mathew sir for this opportunity and thank you all the speakers thank you audience thank you murdila ma'am it is always a pleasure to listen to you uh, because you give so many examples i mean when you had conducted the art integrated uh, learning for sst people were really literally craving for more i mean the number of examples you gave even in this short 10 minutes i think you have given at least 50 ideas on how math science and different subjects can be integrated with sports and how to use puppets so thank you once again it's been really uh, it's a pleasure to always have you as a speaker nadula ma'am and you have been a great support to the aif platform so once again from the bottom of my heart a big thank you for sparing your valuable time today also so on this note uh, uh, i thank archana ma'am who is uh, still present with us right from the beginning to the end uh, thank you archana ma'am and uh, uh, if there are some questions i will just be taking it up and then we'll be winding it up uh, for today and uh, there will be uh, Uh, we'll conclude the session shortly if there are some questions uh, there was a one question uh, mridula ma'am that uh, one participant was asking that uh, um, that is uh, can sports be integrated in all subjects like for example yes. in english it goes uh, then uh, how to uh, integrate that in english so maybe you could take up that one question so uh, why not write an essay on mahendra singh dhoni why yeah, not write okay, the nuclear cricket Yes. Absolutely. Why not create a sports related vocabulary? Yeah, absolutely, right. absolutely. These are just so two ideas. It, it, it's just a matter of putting your brains and you know uh, getting out uh, how to integrate. The integration is possible uh, sports in sports. I think it's the best way of learning and children enjoy sports. That is the best thing. Yes, you yes. take them to the field and they will enjoy and uh, what better way of learning. So on that Ask note, them to I think compose a poem. Ah, yes, of course. Compose a poem. There's so many ideas. Yes. Definitely, yes. Thank you so much, ma'am, and thank you, Brother Lovem. Thank you, Archana, ma'am, for staying till the very end. And uh, thank you, dear uh, audience, who has who have been patient to watch this entire program. I hope we were able to give some suggestions. And thanks to all the principals who had to who join and had to leave for other commitments. And I am really grateful to Archana, ma'am, and Brother Lovem, who stayed till the very end. So thank you and good night, everyone. Thank you. Thank you, sir.